All right. Well, we're in 1 Corinthians, and uh, I just wanted to, uh, as uh, we get going, uh, we uh, did an overview a couple of weeks ago. Uh, this is a very troubled, troubled church uh, and uh, in a culture uh, not unsimilar to the culture that we live in today. Uh, one of the reasons that, uh, that we selected it uh, is a church, um, though that uh, though Paul spent uh, in Acts 18, verse 11, tells us that uh, uh, Paul, st- Paul stayed a year and a half te- teaching them the word of God, trying to build up uh, these saints. Uh, but they had problems. They had problems because of the culture uh, they were in, the, the culture they came out of. Uh, it, it basically is a, is a group of uh, Jews and Gentiles that were uh, really uh, uh, permeated by the, the culture around them in terms of the sensu- sensuality. We talked about uh, the two things about Corinth. To remember, it was a center for uh, commerce and business, so uh, there was a, a very much a materialistic culture. Uh, and because of the, uh, the temple of Aphrodite being there, uh, it was a, a center uh, for sensuality in the same way that Athens was a center for uh, philosophy and intellectualism and um, uh, the academic world, uh, you had uh, its uh, counterpart in a, uh, uh, in a sense here in, uh, in Corinth. Uh, because of that, when uh, th- these folks uh, came to faith in Christ, they brought with them uh, a worldview that was not really a Christian worldview. Uh, and it creates, uh, creates problems then uh, within the church, and Paul's beginning to address the first problem, which is uh, that of division in the church. I think we can go into the next slide, and this will require a little explanation. So, uh, so, so the image here is to help you remember the big theme. So that is um, that is not two apple cores; that's just one. One apple core. You'll notice that he's also an Indian. One core Indian, and uh, what he's doing is spanking the saints. And uh, that's, that's the theme of 1 uh, first, first Corinthians. So uh, if you're in here and your parents ask you later, what was the theme of 1 Corinthians? You can say spanking the saints, if you can remember that. Uh, and the first thing that he's going to deal with uh, that we saw last week is this idea of the lack of unity uh, or division uh, within the church. Uh, we ended up, as Paul dealing with this, uh, he says that in verse 17, as you recall to them, my priority in coming to you uh, was uh, that of preaching the gospel, because they were saying, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Paul, I'm of Cephas, I'm of Jesus, uh, lots, of, lots of division. Paul says, I, I, you know, as far as the whole baptism and who baptized you, I don't even remember all the people I baptized. My priority was uh, the gospel itself. And that's in verse 17, and that kind of helps us get to our, our text this morning. For Christ did not send me to baptize but to preach the gospel not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. And we said that um, uh, the NIV does a good job there, uh, saying lest the cross of Christ be emptied uh, and uh, its power taken away. Paul said, I didn't come with uh, the wisdom uh, of this world, with cleverness uh, of, uh, of speech. Uh, and he's going to talk more now about that idea uh, in the message of the cross and if he's going to bring unity into this church, he's going to have to get them to change their thinking, we might say their worldview, from uh, one that sees the, the wisdom of the world being superior in the philosophies of this world, superior to that of, uh, of Scripture itself. Now, I bring this up from the outset because that's the issue that we have today, uh, is that there are many Christians uh, that uh, have come to faith in Jesus Christ, uh, they are very much like the church here uh, in Corinth, uh, but a lot of their thinking uh, has never, never been changed in terms of how they view life, what's important, uh, and again, their, their philosophy uh, of, uh, of life. Uh, and this is something that uh, uh, these guys dealt with. In, in Corinth, uh, again, uh, it's, a Rome, it's a Roman first century, but as we said before, the Romans had no culture. They just, they just took the culture of the Greeks and uh, and adapted it for themselves. Uh, and they were big over arguing over philosophies. In Corinth, there's at least 50 uh, schools of philosophy. And they love to debate. We're going to see that word uh, in, our, in our text. They love to argue over uh, what school of philosophy they had bought into. And you see, they brought that right into the church, this division and this arguing and, and this debating. And so what Paul's seeking to do is point them back in the direction of the cross itself 
He's going to remind them of who they were before uh, they came to faith in, just, uh, in Jesus Christ. Uh, and, uh, and hopefully then uh, get them to move to more of a Christian worldview. Uh, Martin Lloyd-Jones, a great, great preacher of a generation ago, British preacher, says that the whole drift towards modernism that has blighted the church of God and nearly destroyed its living gospel may be traced to an hour when men began to turn from revelation to philosophy. That's why I said this is very pertinent for us, uh, us today. Uh, again, he's, he's writing, uh, Jones is probably, Dr. Jones is probably writing this uh, in, back in the, uh, uh, the late 50s sometimes, uh, and already talking about the fact that uh, uh, the church is beginning to turn, even at that point, from revelation, God's revelation, to actually uh, philosophy. And, uh, and I'm going to uh, read you a couple of quotes today, one from a, a second century philosopher and one from a, a very famous modern day philosopher to say that uh, uh, that is happening. Now, a lot of you are saying, uh, I'm, that's all sounds good, except I'm not really into philosophy. Well, let me ask you this. Do you watch movies? Do you watch TV? You're into philosophy. You're into philosophy. Uh, there's, uh, those are philosophers ma- making those. You know, you can ask people, uh, name, name me two, two Greek philosophers, uh, and, uh, and most people uh, will only come up with a, a couple of names. One is Aristotle and one is Plato. And the reason they can name those two guys, they made movies. Well, they weren't movies in their day. They were plays and the dramas. And they used entertainment in order to express their, uh, their philosophical view of the world. So you, see, you may say, I'm not into philosophy, but if you go to movies and watch and absorb, and even some television shows, uh, you are actually learning someone's philosophical viewpoint of, of the world. Uh, and so again, I think this is all very, very pertinent to, uh, to us today. Well, our first point is uh, in verses 18 to 20. And again, this whole thing is trying to contrast God's wisdom, which is brought to us by revelation, uh, versus man's wisdom, which is uh, based on uh, philosophy. And we're going to see that the cross, of course, to some is foolish, and to others it's powerful. Uh, Paul writing, again, we're in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God, for it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer, that's that debater of philosophy of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? So the perception first can cause somebody to perish. It depends on how they perceive the cross of Jesus Christ. Uh, Do they see it as a means to their salvation, uh, to having their sins forgiven, uh, or they just relocate it to uh, a myth of the first century? Uh, making no sense to them at all. And the key word here is the the word message, for the message of the cross. This is one of those places, again, where a a King James actually kind of gets it wrong because it uses the word preaching, for the preaching of the cross. It's not the preaching, it's the message itself. It's the content of the message itself. Uh, It's not the person delivering it. It's the message itself that saves some, others reject, and uh, and they perish uh, as a result. I don't know if you ever had that experience. I, I, um, I, I watch and listen carefully, of course, anytime I'm listening to someone else preach or teach or, uh, and so forth, and um, uh, take uh, sometimes co- copious notes and, uh, about why and how they do certain things. And I, I, the, one of the things that amazes me over the years is I, I've heard and seen and watched guys stump, just absolutely stumble now I've got to be careful about stumbling through my own words today. I've watched them stumble through their, their own words uh, and, um, uh, and uh, do not a very good job of, of, uh, of sharing the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ and, see, and seeing like 30 and 40 people respond, respond to it and come to faith in Christ. I, I've heard some beautiful messages that I thought were awesome <laughs> and nobody responds. It's not the preacher. Uh, and that's true for you. When you're sharing the gospel with someone else, it's not you. It's the message itself. That in itself should be an encouragement to us. That's part of what Paul is saying here. Uh, but again, the contrast about this message uh, is that it's foolishness to those that are, 
that are perishing. And then he quotes Isaiah 29.4. And um, certainly this is one of those where a little, a little background helps. The quote is, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Uh, this is uh, Isaiah is a prophet living during the days of Hezekiah, a good king. Uh, and uh, he is dealing with the uh, onslaught of the Assyrians. The Assyrians have grown uh, tremendous in power, probably one of the more brutal brutal cultures that have ever uh, lived on the uh, face of the earth. These are the guys that dream up crucifixion uh, that uh, as they come down in 722 B.C. to take over the ten northern kingdoms uh, there in Israel, uh, and sometimes in villages there were mass suicides rather than be captured by uh, the Assyrians because they literally would skin people alive. And we, we could go on and on. They were just a brutal group of people. Uh, they've come down, they've taken over uh, the, north, the north of Israel, the north, ten northern tribes. They've now made their way down into the uh, Philistine, the five Philistine cities, and they've captured all of them. They're, they're powerful. Uh, the, the idea here is that the worldly wisdom counselor to King Hezekiah uh, say to him, make a deal with Egypt. Make a pact and a treaty with Egypt. If the Assyrians know that uh, the Egyptians have our back, they won't mess with us here uh, in Jerusalem. So that, this is the contrast that Paul is making reference to. Uh, here's the wisdom of the world. Uh, we're believers, but we're going to cut a deal with unbelievers. Isaiah the prophet comes along and says, you know, those chariots will never save you. Do not go down to Egypt. Do not do it. So King Hezekiah has a, a decision to make. He can choose the revelation of God delivered by the prophet, or he can choose the wisdom of the world. That's why Paul's uh, bringing this in, into, into play here. And if you know the, uh, the rest of the story, he does cut a deal with the Egyptians. It still doesn't work out too well. And he finds the city of Jerusalem surrounded now by Sennacherib's army, uh, and the guy that was uh, leading it, if you were here for our, our study in, uh, in Second Kings, uh, has an interesting name. I don't want to embarrass Greg. Do you remember his name? I'm going to give you a hint. The guy that stood on the wall, and he's, they're trash-talking big time, and he's ra all the people are fear and trembling. They're up on the walls of Jerusalem, and uh, he, he speaks Hebrew, and he's just ripping into them, and they're saying back to him, please don't speak Hebrew. You know, we, we speak <laughs> your language, and, but he wants everybody to hear how terrible it's going to be for them if they don't surrender. And the guy that he was talking to, his name... His first name was Rob, and his second name was Shaka, Rob Shaka. Yeah, that was his name. Uh, and he's doing all this trash talking. So now uh, Hezekiah has a choice. Isaiah goes to him again and says, just trust in the Lord. God will deliver us, and it will be by his miraculous power, not by anything human. How are we delivered uh, in terms of our salvation? Not any human wisdom can do it, but only the power of God. And that's the illustration. Hezekiah is a godly king. He takes the letter he's gotten from Sennacherib. He goes in a quiet place and he begins to pray. And the Lord tells him to trust me. Hezekiah says, that's what we're going to do. And that night then, an angel of the Lord goes into the camp of the Assyrians and, uh, and kills 185,000 Assyrians. Uh, and they decided it was time to go home. And, uh, and they hit the road. So that's the, the quote here, do we trust the wisdom of God uh, or do we trust the power of God and God's revelation to us? In that case, it was being delivered by Isaiah. He had the word of the Lord. Now, he then, uh, again, uh, deals with this whole issue of the, uh, do we trust the Lord, the revelation of God, the message of the gospel, or don't we? Uh, in, our, in our own day and age, the, the Bible itself, God's revelation to us, really became uh, under attack in the early part of the, of, of the last century. Uh, and because of that, there's a, a whole group of churches, we call them liberal, because they began to accept philosophies of the world and use them to judge the Bible itself. Up until that time, the Bible was God's revelation. It was God's truth. We use that to judge the philosophies of the world uh, or other things when it comes to uh, life and the meaning of life, the orig origins of life and so forth. Uh, but that all changed, uh, and it's been that way for a while. Uh, this led us to, to uh, a philosophy of origins that's predicated on evolution. 
Uh, that's one of the big philosophies uh, of the world, sometimes referred to as science, but it's really a philosophy, uh, and, uh, and we would say, uh, and it's quite religious, because it takes a lot of faith to, uh, to believe in, uh, uh, in uh, evolution, uh, because uh, there's, just not, there's just not evidence for it. There's evidence for evolution on a horizontal plane, but not on the vertical plane, uh, we, you, just, you just don't see in the uh, geology uh, uh, and so forth. There's just not the evidence for it. It's, uh, it's a big problem for, uh, for people that hold that view, but uh, many of them have tremendous faith, and so they don't need a lot of, uh, a lot of evidence. Uh, it's one of the problems. So what, what has that done to the church? Uh, the church, like the church in Corinth, that now is divided uh, because of holding to philosophies of, uh, of the city that they were in, of which there were many, the church today ends up being divided uh, because we bring that philosophy into the church, uh, and now we believe that um, in what's called theistic evolution or progressive creationism, uh, where we, we look at the philosophy of evolution uh, and we, we bring that and let it judge the Bible and what the Bible says. Uh, and where we can't bring these two ideas together, we hold the philosophy higher than we do Scripture itself. Uh, therefore, uh, this uh, particular philosophy sees that uh, uh, God, God was in it from the beginning, and uh, God began the evolutionary processes, and they kind of merged the philosophy of, uh, of origins of evolution, uh, and they try to uh, blend that with Scripture itself. Again, but uh, Paul is saying, uh, we either have God's wisdom or we have man's wisdom. Uh, the other big uh, uh, philosophy that uh, is uh, really permeated the church uh, today uh, is the uh, philosophy of, uh, of psychology. Uh, one uh, uh, author said uh, of psychology, it seeks to understand and modify the man's inner workings, uh, his mind, emotions, and spirit, uh, by human observation uh, and, uh, and theories. And now, again, in many circles, uh, which has caused great division, that's our, our big theme here, uh, is that you have psychology and those views, which there are many, uh, then overriding or being the judge of God's revelation uh, to us. Uh, and, um, and so the, you end up in this whole talk therapy kind of a thing. There's an acknowledgement that people have guilt and they struggle with guilt. And so the psychologist tries to determine uh, the, uh, the source of that, uh, that guilt and those feelings, but they are never attributed to sin, uh, and therefore they can never be dealt, dealt with. Uh, and then what you need to do is find out Either um, you, have to, it's, you have to find out some reason why your issue and your situation and your guilt can be attributed to someone else. How can we get the guilt off of you? It is a problem, uh, but there's never a recognition that uh, we have guilt because of sin, either our sin or sin against us. Uh, we deal with it, we struggle with it, and the only way that it can be removed is through the forgiveness that's in Jesus Christ. The problem is that is too simple of a message uh, for uh, the academic elites. That's something Paul is going to uh, reiterate here uh, in a moment. And, and it was God's intention from the beginning, he's going to say, to keep this message, the message, the revelation of God in regards to salvation, uh, very simple so uh, anyone could understand it. So the perception uh, of the cross is certainly important in terms of the message. To some, it's uh, uh, because of their perception they're going to perish uh, but to others, uh, it's, uh, it's the power of, of God. Uh, and Paul then deals, uh, gives us four rhetorical questions. He says, where's the wise? Uh, where's the, where is the scribe? Where's the disputer or the debater? Uh, and then the final question, hasn't God made foolish the wisdom uh, of the world? Uh, and these are all uh, uh, kind of interesting what he's pertaining to. And again, it, it does help. It's one of these things where we, this, this uh, can you tell this is not an easy passage? I'm done. <laughs> I should have probably told you that right up front. Uh, and so the, uh, you know, the, the challenge, of course, in these epistles, when Paul gets into the deep weeds, is uh, for me, how much of this do I unpack uh, or, or, or not? But, um, uh, and sometimes it, it helps, though. Uh, it helps to understand uh, uh, the, the obvious meaning here and the application. Where are the wise? Well, this is actually a, a reference to the wise men of Egypt. 
Uh, and that's his point. You, know, you have Moses and Aaron. They go before Pharaoh, let my people go. How, how did those wise men do in regards to uh, their wisdom and their skills and their abilities versus the power of God? Uh, and Paul would say, I don't think they did too well there, if you recall that, uh, uh, those uh, incidents. Uh, so where's the scribe? Now, certainly uh, the Jews had scribes referred to, of course, by Jesus in the New Testament. But this is probably a reference to the Assyrians who also sent their scribes when they went to war because they wanted detail uh, of the things that, uh, that took place and happened. And we have some of those, uh, some of those cuneiform tablets written by the scribes uh, today detailing some of their, uh, their battles and so forth. But how did, how did that work out for, uh, for the Assyrian scribes? When uh, God sends one angel and he kills 185,000 of them one night. Paul says, I don't think that worked out too good. So he's asking these rhetorical questions. Where's the wise? Well, they're not doing too good. Where's the scribe? Well, they kind of hit the road compared to the power of God. Where's the disputer or debater? Uh, again, a direct reference to the, the Greek philosophies. Where, it's almost sarcastic. Where, where's your philosophical debater uh, now? Uh, can he really help you with this and these things in regards to salvation? And he says, of course, then finishes, hasn't God made foolish the wisdom of the world. You guys are arguing over these philosophies. Uh, you've brought this worldview right into the church, and now you are, argue over personalities. I'm of Paul. I'm of Apollos. I think you need to remember uh, the, the message of the cross itself and how foolish is the wisdom of the world. In other words, we're, we're more educated uh, than our forefathers, but we're not more moral. Uh, we have more of a means of helping one another today uh, but we're not less selfish. We have more of a means of, of communication, but we don't understand each other any better. We have more psychology and education, but we also have more crime and we have more war. Uh, so again, the wisdom of the world, Paul would say, is not really uh, helping us. Again, it's the message of the cross, the revelation given through God's word uh, that helps us. Does this mean that man is not wise at all? No, he is. Uh, but we're talking about the, uh, the, uh, uh, the nature of God, the nature of man, uh, the issues surrounding salvation. Uh, we're thankful for the wisdom of man. We're thankful uh, for science, for technology. Uh, we kind of like those little phones that we're carrying around uh, in, our, uh, in our pockets. And of course, we primarily have to thank the Israelis for developing those chips that make it all, all possible. I always uh, get a kick out of the people that want to boycott things from Israel. They say, well, you better dump your cell phone then. You know, well, it's just certain products, you know, we want to. But um, again, we're, we're thankful for these things. It, Paul's not saying uh, that there isn't wisdom out there in the world. Uh, but there's not wisdom in terms of philosophy and education or any of these things that can help you uh, in terms of, of eternal life. Again, many non-believers sometimes are more educated, they're brilliant, they're talented, uh, more experienced than, uh, than other believers. Uh, that's why when we want our car fixed, uh, I, I just want a good mechanic. My mechanic's a Jehovah's Witness. I don't care. He's good and he's reasonable and I, I trust him. And yeah, over the years, you get to share a little bit along, along the way. Uh, if you need an operation, you just want the best surgeon. Has to be a Christian. Only, th only they're the only ones that are wise. No, no, that, that's, not, that's not Paul's point here. That's not what he's, uh, what he's saying. Uh, Christians to thank God for all of the brilliant uh, and wise individuals in, in the world today. Uh, but they can never answer the questions uh, about where we came from, where we're going, uh, why am I here, what is life all about, how do I determine right from wrong in a moral sense, what is the true source of happiness, where does joy come from, where does fulfillment come from, where do I and can I go to have any kind of a peace in my heart. Those philosophies of the world and that brilliance will never answer uh, any of those questions. So the perception of some caused them to perish. The perception of sun is contrasted to the power of God. And thirdly, in regards to perception, it prevents some of them from understanding the cross. That's in verse 18. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those uh, that are perishing. This idea that God would become a man, born as a baby, baby in a manger in, uh, in Bethlehem, uh, and that he would grow up and live a perfect sinless life, that he would die on, on a Roman cross. It's just hard to accept. Hey, it was hard for the disciples to accept. 
Uh, do you remember Peter's remarks with, uh, with Jesus when he's sharing with him that he needs to go to Jerusalem and die on a Roman cross? In Matthew 16, verse 22, Peter says, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. And then uh, Jesus' reply is sharp and, it, and it's quick. Uh, he turns to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me, uh, for you are not mindful, here it is, of the things of God, the wisdom of God, the revelation of God, versus the things of men or the wisdom of this world. You're not mindful. Uh, you don't uh, understand Peter at all. Uh, and of course, uh, again, the cross is an offense to people. It was to Peter, but uh, uh, years later, of course, uh, after the death and resurrection of Jesus and being filled with the Holy Spirit, he would say of Jesus, he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross that we might die to sin and live to righteousness, for by his wounds you were healed. Uh, how people perceive the cross uh, is critical, Paul says. Secondly, the plan of God that displays his wisdom and power, verse 21 to 25, for since the wisdom of God... The world through wisdom did not know God. It pleased God through the foolishness of the message to preach to save those who believe. For Jews request a sign, Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block and to the Greeks foolishness. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Now, God, God is never foolish, nor is God ever weak. It's a reference to the message of the cross and how it's perceived by people. So we note first that God's plan was a stumbling block to, to the Jews. The word stumbling block, we hear it from time to time in the New Testament. It's interesting. It's a, literally, we could say it's a death trap. Uh, if uh, it, was, uh, it was used uh, of the trigger uh, on an animal trap uh, that was always fatal. Uh, the point of the stick or whatever had to be tripped, and then the trap would come down, always fatal. Uh, so literally, he's saying that uh, uh, to the Jews, it's a death trap, uh, this, this idea of a, uh, of a crucified Savior. They just don't get it. Uh, when they think about their history, uh, they think about uh, Moses and the deliverance. Uh, they, they think about Elijah and Elijah. They think about Daniel and the lion's den. They think about the great miracles that uh, surround their faith. And so they want a sign, and they ask for signs many times uh, of Jesus. Uh, and one of those is in Matthew 12, 38, as you remember. Then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered, saying, Teacher, uh, we want to see a sign from you, is a question they asked many times. Verse 39, but he answered and said to them, an evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will rise up in judgment against this generation and condemn it, because they repented at the preaching of Jonah, the message, the revelation of God to them. They repented and indeed, a greater than Jonah uh, is uh, here. Uh, Jesus did many miracles, thousands of them, mostly most of them public. Uh, John builds his gospel around the seven signs or miracles that Jesus did and seven I am statements. It's not that he didn't do miracles, he did, but they always wanted more. Give me one more. Uh, let me tell you what I want it to be. There's people out there like that. There's Jewish people out there like that today. Uh, they need a sign, they need a miracle, uh, and then they'll believe. And Jesus is saying to them, uh, that's not going to do it. Uh, if the message, like in Jonah, again, the illustration is death and resurrection of Jonah, uh, certainly, uh, but it's the message. How, how did the people of Nineveh get saved? It was the message. They heard the message and they repented. That's how they got saved. They didn't get saved because of a miracle. Uh, they didn't save because of... Uh, uh, a little guy showed up on their beaches that should have been afraid of them, being Jewish, probably bleached out white and looked like death warm over after being in this great fish for three days. Uh, but what saved them was the message itself. And that's Paul's, Paul's point uh, here. Uh, the Jews asked for a sign. He says, no sign will be, com be coming. Uh, you'll either believe the message or, or you won't. You remember Luke 16? Yeah, you have the story Jesus telling of the wise man and Lazarus that are both uh, in, in Abraham's bosom. 
Uh, and there's, uh, <coughs> there's comfort on one side, there's torment on the other, there's a gulf in between. Lazarus says, please, send, him, send someone back to tell my brothers uh, uh, about this place. Yeah. Uh, Jesus says, even if one goes back from the dead, will they believe? They won't believe. Uh, of course, our message is centered around the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Uh, it's God's revelation to us, his message, the simple message of the gospel that, that saves People will not get saved through miracles. And, uh, you know, I, and I could go to, uh, down a little list, but <clears throat> I you know, kind of love to uh, tell the story of being outside of Madras, India, and, uh, and, and be there with Mike Stingle and sharing the gospel, and people came forward, and there's healing lines, and we prayed for, prayed for a little boy that was uh, never been able to speak or hear in his life. Uh, he was about the uh, uh, age of my son at the time, about five or six years old, so... Uh, it was a little little personal as I, I prayed for him, and then and and God healed him. I just tell me it wasn't my great faith because the translator s- tells me tell him to speak. <laughs> After we prayed, it's a good idea. We we're praying for it, that he'd be healed. So we ask, and then he says uh, he says Afta, which is similar to the Hebrew Abba. He's saying Daddy. First time his father ever heard it. Father begins to weep and cry. Uh, he's the, the translator. Brother, tell him. Tell him, clap your hands. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? I'm sorry, I have to do my Indian accent. And the kid could hear. And that dad went home with his chalk markings on his forehead, a happy Hindu that night. He went home a happy Hindu. The miracle did not say, you would think that, and we're very clear, this is Jesus that's doing this. And if you want to put your faith in him, you have to repent and turn from all the the many gods that you now worship. Didn't do it. Didn't do it. Uh, that's what Paul is, uh, is saying here. Secondly, to the Greeks or the Hellenists, literally, uh, that would be just the Gentiles, everybody else, it's, uh, uh, it's foolishness because they, there was such an emphasis on, uh, on wisdom as, as there, is, there is today. And, um, uh, and here's where I want to read to you from a second century philosopher named uh, Silas uh, who says uh, the following, uh, God is good and beautiful, and happy, Uh, and if that which is most beautiful and best, if then he descends to man, uh, involves a change for him, a change from good to bad, from beautiful to ugly, from happiness to unhappiness, from what is best to what is worst, and God would never accept such a change. If God is as good as you say, if he's as powerful as you say, uh, if he created the whole world and uh, he has that ability, he would surely never leave that and become like us. He would never go from the best to the worst. It's the incarnation. People struggle with that. People today struggle with that. Uh, they, they look at Jesus as an unemployed carpenter who died on a Roman cross, and it's a shame. The message of the cross to some, to some who believe, hey, it's the power of God. Uh, but to the ones that don't, uh, it's a philosophical issue they can't uh, deal with. So again, Paul uh, asked them questions. Uh, how's, again, how's the wisdom doing? Uh, your philosophies, do you know God personally? Uh, and of course, they, they don't. Uh, and you can say the same if you have a, a Jehovah's Witness come to your door. They do not know God personally. They do not. They have no testimony. They have no time when they can say, and this is how God met me, and God forgave me of all my sins, and God began to change me. And change. They, they've never heard that. It's shocking when you tell them their story. If you can get your testimony in, those three minutes in the doorway before the one pulls the other away, there's always someone that's new and is interested, and there's always the uh, hardcore person that dra- drags them away. That's a unique thing we have, the story that we have of God's power transforming our lives. Paul says this in arguing about this worldly wisdom uh, there in Athens in Acts 17, there in the Aragopius, he says uh, in verse 30 of Acts 17, truly, uh, these times of ignorance, this idea of this belief in these worldly philosophies and so forth, uh, in the, it's a time of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. Why? Because he's appointed a day when he will judge the world in righteousness by the man who he's ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. And when they had heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, while others said, we will hear 
you again on this matter. So Paul departed from among them. And there were a few uh, that came to faith uh, in Christ of, of those Greek, Greek philosophers. But it was not their wisdom that got them there. That's Paul's point. Uh, it, uh, it didn't help them experience salvation. Thirdly, in terms of God's plan, it's explained in a simple message. That's in the, the second half of verse 21. It pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those uh, who believe. Again, that preach is the term proclamation, but it's declaring a, a message. Now, Paul over in Romans 10, 17 says a very familiar verse to us. Uh, again, one of these, uh, I love these uh, often misquoted verses. Uh, Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Uh, that, that is often quoted, and then uh, Christians are encouraged to study your Bibles more because that's the Word of God, uh, and then your, your faith will be increased. I think if you study your Bible more, your faith will be increased, but that's not what the verse is saying. Literally, it's saying faith, saving faith, salvation. That's the subject if you uh, went to, to look at it in context. Salvation, saving faith comes from hearing the message, our same word that uh, we see here the message concerning Jesus Christ. People are only uh, saved and experience salvation through the simple message uh, of the gospel uh, of Christ. Uh, again, Paul was, uh, we would say, he believed in the supernatural. He, he did miracles. He was also a brilliant man. He was a, a rationalist. Uh, but he's saying the supernatural, uh, nor rational thinking of its own, does not save people uh, it's the simple message of the gospel, and it's hard sometimes for the Gentiles, who are not looking for a sign, but they're looking for uh, wisdom. They can't comprehend this idea of, a, of an unemployed itinerant rabbi dying on a Roman cross and how that somehow affects their uh, right standing before God. Now, the other philosopher that I wanted to read a quote to you from is uh, Richard Dawkins. Dawkins wrote The God Delusion, uh, Outspoken Atheist. Uh, is what we call the, the new atheists, they're, and, uh, and that is uh, they, <laughs> they're aggressive, and uh, uh, they're activists, and uh, they're not just saying, this is my position, they're, they're out to win the world over. Uh, so in a sense, a brilliant guy who's a, we might call him an evangelist for the uh, atheistic position. Now, he's being uh, interviewed uh, in this quote in Time Magazine. Uh, he has done a, a debate uh, with a man named Francis Collins, who also has a, has a scientific background, and they've been kind of going back and forth a little bit. Uh, and at the end of the interview, then Dawkins says this, My mind is not closed to the idea of God, as you have occasionally suggested, Francis. Uh, my mind is open to the most wonderful range of future possibilities, which I cannot even dream about, nor can you, nor can anyone else, anybody else. I don't see the Olympian gods... Or Jesus coming down and dying on the cross as worthy of that grandeur. If there is a God, it's going to be a whole lot bigger and a whole lot more incomprehensible than anything that any theologian or any religion has ever proposed. He goes, it's not that I couldn't believe in a God, but if I did, it couldn't be your God. Because I can't believe like the second century philosopher, I can't believe that a God that is so powerful that he can speak uh, uh, the universe into uh, existence uh, would leave that and come down and die on a Roman cross for my sins. I just can't get there. Which is the position of a, a lot of uh, very brilliant uh, uh, scientists who have become theist because of the evidence that's out there in terms of uh, uh, the uh, complexity of, of design whether it's that GNA or whether it's the, the universe, or DNA, excuse me, or the universe, uh, they can be, get there to become a, a, a theist. They can't get there in terms of, uh, of salvation. Uh, it's foolishness to them, uh, and they, they reject the message. Now, Paul makes it personal here. Uh, the application uh, to, to the church was personal. Uh, if there's, uh, he's going to deal with the issue of division in the church, uh, he's got to get them back to the simplicity of the message of the gospel. You've got to let those worldly philosophies go that are causing division. You can't bring that mindset uh, over into the church because we want to have unity so that uh, people will know we're truly loved by God and love one another. Uh, and he says, I need to remind you of a few things, and that's in verse 26 to 29. Uh, For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh... 
<clears throat> not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. And the base things of the world, and the things which are despised, God has chosen. And the things which are not, to bring to nothing the things that are, that no flesh should glory uh, in his presence. So again, uh, those listening uh, would uh, fully uh, understand what Paul is saying here in terms of their own personal lives. Uh, so we're seeing first it was personal, as Paul reminded them of what they were. Uh, and he says that not many of you were wise. That means you, not, you, there's not a lot of brilliant guys out there in this church that he's writing to. Uh, there's some, uh, you know, and we've uh, mentioned Crispus, who was a synagogue leader and uh, obviously very highly educated and so forth. But m- for the most part, Christians uh, in the first century, uh, not, not many wise. It, it's, not, it's not your brilliance, if you'll remember what you were like before. Uh, now, he's, he's going to give a counterpart, though, to these three things later at the end. He's going to say, but you know what? God gave you wisdom when you got saved. You didn't have it before. But before that, not many brilliant Mighty, uh, ability, uh, it's, it's not your abilities that uh, have brought you uh, into the king, kingdom of God. Noble is where we get our word uh, eugenics, or, uh, so it's, it's not your genetics, it's not your DNA, it's not your bloodline and so forth uh, that uh, has uh, benefited you uh, at, uh, at all uh, in, uh, in any way. It's, um, I mentioned doing the uh, uh, Ancestry.com thing, it was, uh, I, I did the the DNA test, it was, uh, it was kind of interesting, and, and uh, it, uh, it doesn't help me in regards to my salvation, but uh, it helps explain a few things. You see, I have these tra- trace elements uh, going to the Iberian Peninsula. Do you know where that is? Portugal. So that, doesn't that help explain a few things right there? But uh, I, I didn't know that. I didn't know that. So it might help explain things, but it doesn't help you in regards to salvation. Notice in verse 28, he kind of gives them the, the blow here. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised, God has chosen, and the things which are not. That phrase, things that are not, would be the most contemptible expression in the Greek language, one writer said. When, I mean, he kind of lets them have it. He says, you guys were nothing. You were nothing before you came to faith in Jesus Christ. Not many wise, not many mighty, not many of no- noble birth. He's making it very personal. And we've got division. Let's remember the cross and the simplicity of the cross. And let's remember what God has, has done for us. Secondly, it was personal, as Paul reminded the Corinthians, of why God called them. Verse 27, big contrasting word here, but, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. Uh, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame uh, the things that are mighty. Again, the same three uh, elements that, that are here. Uh, again, the, uh, there's just people in the world that uh, don't understand why and how Christians are so transformed. One of the big, uh, again, just to kind of bring this into a contemporary setting, one of the big arguments uh, that's out there in the world today uh, is the issue of, uh, of homosexuals coming to faith in Christ and being transformed and changed uh, from that previous lifestyle. There's some people that don't even like the idea. They think that's a terrible thing. Uh, but yet uh, uh, we see it as a wonderful thing uh, that uh, uh, the, the adulterer, uh, the, the, whatever it is, the drug addict that can be uh, saved by God, the person that's addicted to alcohol that can be saved by God, and his life can be transformed. Uh, the world has no explanation uh, for that at all. Uh, a couple of books that just, just came out that I'll just mention in passing. One is called Messy Grace. This is uh, written by a pastor whose parents were both g- gay. So he's got some uh, interesting insights in, uh, in growing up and what God's grace has meant to, to him uh, and uh, Messy Grace. Uh, Caleb uh, 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 Kaltenbach. Uh, also by uh, Danny Burke and uh, Heath Lambert. Uh, the title of their book is, uh, just came out, Transforming Homosexuality, What the Bible Says About Sexual Orientation and Change. And it's about the fact that people's lives are changed. They're dramatically changed. Uh, it's one of the reasons that uh, we love to come and worship God because we, we got something to celebrate in terms of God's transforming power. It makes no sense to the wisdom according to the wisdom uh, of, of the world. Again, it was uh, a sinful attitude that pride that brought division in this church 
And Paul says we got to get back to the simplicity of the message of the cross. The power is in that, in the message, not the person delivering it. Uh, and if you'll remember what your life was like before, uh, and if I would say, and if you remember what your life was like before, it should be humbling. It should take you away from pride into a place of humility. Uh, and God gives uh, grace then to the humble. Uh, our fourth point, lastly, where we're going to see these three elements of the argument, the wise, the mighty, and the noble mentioned again, uh, is in verse 30 and 31, the provision of the message of the cross. Uh, but of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. That is, as it is written, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. So uh, four elements that, uh, that uh, he mentions and we'll mention briefly here in terms of uh, salvation. Uh, the first provision is, uh, as I mentioned, God's wisdom. Uh, uh, it is instant uh, and it's progressive. It's instant and it's progressive. Uh, you mean I'm a little smarter when I get saved? Yeah, that's what that means. And we're hoping you're going to get a lot smarter in terms of wisdom about, about your life. It may not help you on a, on a math test next week. Uh, but it will, might help you in making decisions in the future uh, about your life and about relationships and about priorities and, uh, and, and so forth. Uh, it's instant and it's progressive. Uh, in 2 Corinthians, writing to the same church later, chapter 4, verse 6, Paul uh, says, uh, For it is, the, uh, it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who is shown in our hearts, and to give light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of, of Jesus Christ. Uh, the same God that spoke physical light brings light, uh, the light of the knowledge of Jesus Christ uh, into our hearts. The second provision uh, of the cross includes uh, God's righteousness. One uh, definition uh, helps us. Uh, rightness means uh, to be something or someone uh, you should be. Uh, right as opposed to wrong, good as opposed to evil, sinless as opposed to sinful. And that, that's really the issue. I mean, if you're sharing with friends, with, with family members, uh, they need to come to faith in Jesus Christ so they can be made righteous. Uh, it's not even an issue of morality. Uh, we don't come to Jesus Christ so we can become more moral people. We hope that we are. But we come so we can be made righteous right before God, to have my sins forgiven and be able to have a relationship with, with Jesus Christ. Uh, and certainly that's uh, reflected uh, uh, in many places in Paul's writings in Romans and Galatians. But Romans 4, 5 says, But to him who does not work or does good works, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. Again, God made him who had no sin uh, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God, 2 Corinthians 5, 21. The third provision of the cross is sanctification. I mentioned that in the introduction to, uh, to the epistle, uh, declared righteous in Christ, we're set apart, we're made separate so that we can begin to walk in the Spirit, we can bear the fruit of the Spirit, the love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, all those things that God can bring to fruition uh, in our lives. And then lastly, the fourth provision includes God's redemption, and that's that word for uh, buying a slave back from the slave market. Uh, we were enslaved to sin under the power of sin, uh, but God redeems us uh, and he buys us back. So uh, in dealing with the whole issue, uh, Paul spanking the saints, he's got to deal with uh, division in the church, uh, and he does that by uh, opening his epistle uh, with just a wonderful introduction we saw a few weeks ago of the grace of God. Uh, to these believers. Uh, and then he deals with the issue itself and points them to the cross itself, uh, reminds them of their uh, own life and their own testimonies, and says that God has done all of this uh, so that you would glory in him. And that cross should destroy uh, any bit of pride uh, in and of our lives. Amen? Well, let's pray. Lord, we thank you for uh, the simple message of, of the gospel. And uh, as we share it with people, we, we do recognize that there are those that um, are predisposed uh, for some reason to want some kind of a sign or, or a miracle. And, and we love it that you do miracles. Uh, we love it that you still heal. We love it that you just can uh, uh, do such amazing things uh, in, in our lives. Uh, but we also realize that that actually won't save anyone. Lord, we are 
also are combated with the, the philosophies uh, of, of this world. Uh, and we're, we're subject to them if we don't <coughs> have a critical mindset when we watch a movie, read a book, whatever it is, from, from some other perspective other than a, a biblical revelation. Lord, uh, help us to never allow a philosophy to take the place of judgment over your word. Lord, we want to exalt your word. It's, it's the pinnacle of truth for us. It gives us discernment. Lord, help us to not lose that. Lord, help us as we remember our, our own salvation, that uh, of us, not, not many were, uh, were wise, not many were mighty, not many were noble. But Lord, you've, uh, you've saved us as a testimony of your grace. You change us and transform us that people might understand and believe and put their faith in the simple message of the gospel. Christ crucified for our sins. We place our faith in him and then by your grace, uh, we are saved. Lord, help us to declare, proclaim the word that Paul uses, uh, that simple message to those around us. The power's in the message, not in our delivery. And so, Lord, help us to remember that. Give us the boldness we need. Lord, may we uh, remove any bit of pride of our own life uh, as we meditate on and think about what you've done for us uh, in Jesus Christ on the cross. And we pray this in his name. Amen.